pleasure to see everybody out here early on a Monday morning after the film festival. Uh, first off, I want to thank Buzz Kuzak, the owner of the Charles Theater, who was up very late last night and got here very early this morning so that we could uh, have our event here today. So, Buzz, thank you. And he's still, I think, doing some last-minute things up there. Also, Buzz's number one assistant is Raven the House Cat. So I'm giving everybody fair notice that there is a cat moving its way around. It's a, it's a terrific cat. His name is Raven, uh, very friendly. Uh, so I'm giving you a fair warning there. Uh, my name is Will Backstrom, and I am the Community Development Banking Officer for PNC Bank. And uh, this event really is an outcome of the Mayor's Cultural Town Hall that happened last fall, in which the mayor, who will be here in a few minutes, is running a little bit late, uh, was asked a number of questions about how creative people can gain access to the city's vacant houses. And so the mayor had spoken with Bill Gilmore and Randy Vega at the Baltimore Office of Promotion of the Arts, uh, who kind of thought about it. And they came to PNC and they said, how do we fit this into some of the things that you all have been doing around financial education for creative people? So this event really is an outcome of a directive that the mayor gave the city and the city's working with us. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, and welcome all of you. A couple things, I think everybody knows where the restroom is, but you go out, turn right, turn right, and it's all the way in the back. In the event that there's a big emergency, you see your emergency exits here. Um, we have to be out of this theater proper at 12 and out of the theater, the uh, lobby of the theater at 1, so we may speed things up a little bit. But anyway, welcome. Uh, to kick things off, I'd like to introduce my uh, PNC Bank Regional President, Laura Gamble, to the podium to kick things off, and we'll uh, start our educational session about home ownership for the creative class. Laura? Good morning. I am thrilled to be here with you today and my colleagues, uh, Will Backstrom and his team. PNC is very excited to, about being a partner in the Mind Your Business Home Ownership Opportunities for the Creative Leaders of Baltimore's New Economy Workshop. Man, that's a mouthful. Um, we believe this program is another step forward in helping the creative leaders of Baltimore come together in efforts to strengthen the neighborhoods that we call home. Neighborhoods are what make Baltimore a great place to live and work and visit cultural institutions like the one we're in today. And there are always opportunities for us to rebuild and grow these neighborhoods. And the goal of this workshop is to promote home ownership opportunities to our creative leaders. I would especially like to thank, again, PNC's community development team, led by Will Backstrom, for making this partnership possible. This team of experts works with nonprofits, business leaders, elected officials, faith-based organizations, and others to collaborate on initiatives that provide affordable housing and financial independence for low to moderate income residents and communities in the greater Maryland area. Now in its sixth year, the team has already provided a significant amount of money in grants and loans to assist nonprofits and businesses and help to low to moderate income individuals and families. Whoa. <laughs> Hello. That was just in case some of you had not had your coffee. That was your wake-up call. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of this event, and we look forward to helping make Baltimore an even better place to live, work, and play. Thank you. Well, so um, about a year and a half ago, uh, PNC Bank, in partnership with Station North and the NEA, uh, paid for and sponsored something you may have heard of called Open Walls Baltimore, where we brought in really spectacular muralists from around the world to help invigorate what is now the Arts and Entertainment District, the Station North Arts and Entertainment District, and we had a kickoff event. And I gotta tell you, at that event, what I learned a lot was that A, we have a very vibrant uh, and thriving arts community. And what I also learned at that event is that we have a mayor that is absolutely, completely committed to making this place a vibrant city. The mayor and the city got behind that project in ways that were absolutely beneficial to that being a successful event. And so today I'm very pleased to introduce our great mayor, Stephanie Rawlings Blake to help welcome you to this event and talk a little bit about her vision for our city and uh, how important the creative class is to, to, to her and to the city of Baltimore. Your Honor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is certainly my pleasure to be here. Let me slide the 
mic over. And I'm excited to see so many of you uh, today, this Home Ownership for, uh, Forum spotlighting uh, working and living in Baltimore City. Um, I was reminded as I walked in that this conversation is a result of the cultural town hall that we held uh, last year that uh, the question came up about incentives and what the city does to encourage a creative class to fully participate in um, we, you know, the American dream, owning your own uh, home. Yeah, that is, the cat is a little, um, <laughs> I guess you're... That's the mayor of the theater. I want that. <laughs> this is the mayor of the city. That's Baltimore, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you were introducing me and the cat walked up, it reminded me of Bewitch. I said That's I was right. just going to go. I wasn't sure. And no, you know, never mind. <laughs> Many of you are probably too young to even know what I'm talking about. So anyway, so today's an opportunity for everyone to learn about important and useful information about buying a home in Baltimore City, including mortgage tips, tax benefits, and much, much more. Yeah, I have a, a vision for growing Baltimore by 10,000 uh, families within the next decade. And it's based on the commitment of so many of our partners to, uh, to get in on the process. And what does that mean? That means that uh, from the city side, we have to be partners in creating uh, the doors for which uh, so many can walk through to become homeowners. And uh, we depend on our partners, you know, these different groups in the city, whether they are uh, immigrants or the creative class or uh, empty nesters, you know, we're depending on all the different groups to participate and be partners and to come to the door uh, as, and uh, so we can work on these, um, you know, work in collaboration as, as true partners to grow our city. We know that everybody, it doesn't matter, um, you know, who you are, where you're from, everyone wants the, the same thing. They want uh, better schools. Uh, for their children, they want uh, safer, safer streets, and uh, they want strong neighborhoods. And to me, strong neighborhoods mean more than just having uh, bricks and mortar, but it means diversity. It means having uh, a little bit of everything, and that's why the cat doesn't surprise me, because you know that's to me that's Baltimore. You know, that we are. It's a very rich uh, culture, uh, very diverse. Uh, that we are a city of neighborhoods, and when we say it, we mean it. That uh, you can't, uh, you can, you can drive through Baltimore and know that you're someplace different, uh, and and I appreciate that. You know, I get to travel quite a bit, and sometimes when you're in a neighborhood, you go to a city, you can't tell one part from the next, and um, I like uh, the fact that our neighborhoods have unique character, and they are not going to relent to uh, melt, you know, melding in to uh, anyone or anybody else. So I appreciate that. So our schools are improving, crime is down, neighborhoods are stronger, and we proposed a 10-year financial plan uh, after taking an assessment of the uh, city's financial forecast. And we're doing that so we can put the city on a firm financial path for the future. Uh, why? Uh, because we know, everything that we know about um, how you grow the city, you need to be safe, you need to have stronger schools, you also need to be competitive in our property tax. Everybody knows it, but then how do you get there? And part of the 10-year financial plan is making the tough decisions now so we can reduce the property taxes, we can make investments in the future, and we can give a strong, you know, instead of that, that forecast that talks about being $750 million in debt, we could have a forecast that talked about having more recreation centers, new schools, uh, more uh, bridges and uh, re renovated schools and, and uh, new recreation centers, all the things that people want to see in the future of their city to know that it is a vibrant, uh, vibrant and thriving city. So we're working on all of those things and as artists you're certainly critical to the goal of growing Baltimore by 10,000 families. So uh, we know, uh, in, particularly in the creative class, you know that uh, family means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, we don't strictly define families by a married couple, two, 2.5 kids and a dog. Uh, we can be, a family can be a collective of artists and friends that work and live together. It can be one person living and creating in Highland Town and Station North or the Bromo uh, Tower Arts and Entertainment District. However, this opportunity is not only list, uh, limited to our arts and entertainment dis districts. Opportunities to live in, in a home that you love exists throughout Baltimore in many neighborhoods. And buying a home in Baltimore, uh, and by buying a home in Baltimore, you uh, become a fat part of a very interesting um, 
the interesting fabric of our city. Uh, even when a neighborhood expands through development, the roots of that neighborhood remain intact. And when property values rise, home ownership allows you to stay and grow in a community um, and not be put out uh, by increasing uh, rents. And that's why I'm sending a message, message to artists, to designers, musicians, crafters, performers, and other creative co uh, contributors across the um, country to move here and become a part of growing Baltimore. And that's really why I wanted to share this message to you. You know, when you see things like uh, Baltimore being ranked uh, one of the top uh, cities in the country for our underground music scene or being uh, ranked because of the, the visual artists and the, all the different things that we know we possess, people want to be a part of it. And then we have to they ask the question, how? And this is how, and you can tell them how. Um, we have housing stock that is affordable, and through our Vacants to Value initiative, we can connect you with newly renovated homes and great neighborhoods. And I want to thank uh, the members of my housing team. Can you, did you already get recognized? If not, can you please stand all my housing team members? Come on. Thank you very much. Thank you. With uh, our housing, uh, with our Vacants to Value initiatives, uh, that program brings money to the table to help with home ownership. I met a woman last year who combined a number of incentive programs and brought over $40,000 uh, to the table at closing. And because she was a uh, first owner, first time owner of a one time vacant uh, property, she's eligible for great property tax incentives as well. So I hope you take time to speak to uh, representatives from our housing department. I see Steve from Live Baltimore, who's another great partner in, in all of this. You know, I'm, I am hopeful uh, that you walk out of here armed and ready uh, to uh, set down roots in Baltimore and spread the word because we are working really hard to create uh, these, these incentives and, and programs that speak to the needs of Baltimore, our, our future homeowners. So hopefully uh, you will take advantage of it and share the information. And if there are things that we can do, just like you know, this grew out of a conversation uh, we had about something totally unrelated. If you think there are things that we can do to enhance this program to speak to your needs, please, 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 you saw the people stand up. Those are the people to talk to because we want to get it right so we can encourage more of you uh, to put down roots in Baltimore. So again, thank you very much uh, for having me here and I'm looking forward to getting some good reviews and uh, out of this productive session. Thank you very much. Thank you. So 10 years ago, I was living in a little row house in Irvington in the southwest corner of the city. And I had bought the house 15 years before that. Uh, and I got married. And my wife moved in my house, my little row house, my bachelor pad. And my wife had recently got her Master of Fine Arts from Micah. And um, so the, the house was just entirely too small. And so we decided we were going to buy a bigger house. And um, Basically, she made the announcement right then and there that she was not going to live in a row house. Which, in this town, <laughs> kind of tough, right? And so I thought I had been to every square inch of the city, but the very first thing that I did was sulk upstairs to the computer, and I went to something called livebaltimore.com. And it was there that I started to explore our city virtually. And it's uh, there that I actually found the neighborhood I live in now, which is called Windsor Hills, which is way out on the west side of the city. No one's ever heard of it. Come visit us sometime. <laughs> but we found a technical difficulty. We found a, uh, a, a single family house. Uh, it had a yard and it had a terrific spot in the basement with uh, enough natural light to where she could put a working studio in there. So what, with that, I'd like to introduce, hopefully technologically we haven't lost it, uh, but uh, he's so good. Steve Gondal from the Live Baltimore uh, Marketing Center. Come up and tell us what Live Baltimore is. Thank you, Will. I'm going to adjust my stance so whether you can hear me so there's no echo effect. Um, but good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, all right, I think we're kind of all warming up. I wasn't sure if we would have technical capa uh, capabilities or not. So, you know, I brought handy dandy old school stuff. Um, as Will mentioned, how many of you are familiar with Live Baltimore? Show of hands. Oh my God, that is great. That is great. I was with Will um, when I was leaving school in Cincinnati. I actually was on the Live Baltimore site and I thought it was fascinating. One really great thing about us is that there really aren't many organizations like Live Baltimore in the country that really make the home search, neighborhood search process uh, feasible. So 
Um, that's great to see. So many of you have already discovered us. All right, let's kick into our presentation. Talk a little bit about how Live Baltimore, and I think it's fitting that we're the first uh, presenter today because we really do try to be your first stop before we connect you to all the other partners that help along the way. And the home buying process in Baltimore is exciting, it's complicated, uh, but you know, we're all here to help you. So we'll start off with uh, the next slide. So many of you may know us by those clever bumper stickers or even our mobile billboards called license plates. Um, a lot of people say, that's so great that you guys do I Love City Life, and that's all. That's actually probably a half of 1% of what we do. It's really just to kind of support um, you know, our overarching mission. But we do bring a lot of civic pride and love for city life in general, whatever that is to you and to your friends. Next slide. Really what we do is uh, you know, we help people answer the question, why live in Baltimore? And uh, if you've ever been to our office on 343 North Charles Street, you're welcome to come join us, meet us there. We have a huge map, not this big, but uh, somebody walks in, and they, this is pretty much what happens. They look at that, and they, where to start? If you're not familiar with Baltimore, if you're new here, that's overwhelming. And we tell them that's just the city of Baltimore, 81 square miles, 250 plus different neighborhoods. And we start breaking it down a couple of different ways on, let's, let's see what fits for you. Next slide. So first question, what kind of housing type are you looking for? Maybe it is our row home that Will had to leave. Or it's a Victorian uh, farm style house up in the Northeast. Or maybe it's more of a detached colonial. I think probably nine times out of 10 when somebody comes into our office, they get stuck on that first thing. I, I only think of the city as row homes and I'm not interested. We really do a lot um, to get people thinking about, there are so many different styles of architecture in the city that we really wanna make sure that they're aware of where those uh, home types exist. The next question we're gonna ask you, next slide. Location, Not, uh, it's more about what do you want to be nearby? So the first thing we'll say is, do you need to be near transit? Will your, your time here involve taking the train up or down the East Coast? Do you want to be near amenities like the JFX Farmer's Market or the Waverly Farmer's Market? Um, do you need to commute on I-95 in your Grand Prix car there? Uh, I'm not sure what you guys drive. <laughs> I have a hatchback. But, um, or is it a, a cultural lifestyle decision you want to be in? Uh, and, you know, kind of near Will's neighborhood, the Gwyns Falls Trail. Um, and people are like, wow, you guys are asking a really a lot of questions. And it's like, because I, we really can't help you until we know more. But these play important parts. Knowing the type of home that you absolutely want to be in and knowing what you need to be near. If you will be commuting south every day, I'm sure that you'd love just to be able to walk to Penn Station. And we're in a great neighborhood right here, as in West Baltimore as well, um, to take the train. But, you know, identifying those questions will really help you focus down. So we had the housing type that you're looking for and maybe a unique locational thing you must have. Next slide. Affordability, what can you afford? Maybe it is starting off simple with that row home, you know, very practical. Maybe some of you have grander plans and wanna go with the executive mansion. And I know there's some of you out here who have that middle one in mind, you know, the fixer upper. I'm gonna get in there and put my touch on it, whatever. That's okay, there are pricey things that come along with it. Uh, one of the things that I think most people don't know about Live Baltimore is we do a lot of research. And every year, we, uh, we collect the data for the average and median price of every neighborhood in the city of Baltimore, whether it had zero homes sold or a th uh, 500. Um, so it's a lot of great information that we will share with you. And it's also available on our website. But these are questions, you know, what you can afford, where you want to live, what do you need to be in your life. Next slide. So how does it work? Uh, you know, there's incentives that will help you with this uh, process. Some of them are place-based, maybe certain neighborhoods. Others might be historic-based. Uh, there's 77 historic neighborhoods. Or some of them might be program-based, like vacancy value, which you'll hear next. All of them combined will help with that. The next question is, is, again, what's your employment like? Are you a small farmer or you're a small business? Maybe you work for City Hall or you're in a circus. Uh, <laughs> Or, many of you, you work from home. And I want to thank the friends of Drew Hill Park and the Rawlings Conservatory for sharing these beautiful train garden photos, but we think it kind of captures the questions we have is, we, we're not lenders, but we kind of need to know where the money's coming from. And so, balancing the types of incentives that are out there against your employment will really help us understand um, some unique programs you may qualify for. Uh, and again, this is part of the process. When you see a little bit later, um, 
the depth of incentives. It's, it's quite impressive, but uh, keep that in mind. Next slide. So how do we fit into this? And it's really simple. We, we really try to help you find a place that you can call home. Um, and we do it through, for incoming and current residents, you don't have to, you know, uh, you definitely, um, it is for everybody. And we encourage the neighborhood exploration. There's a lot out there. Please don't tell me you did not find a neighborhood that meets what you're looking for. It is a huge city. Next slide. So um, I do it really simply. Every single person that works at the Baltimore lives in the city. I'm the only transplant. I'm from Ohio. Everybody else on staff is from the Baltimore region. But you know, we do things like this. We encourage you to come to our office. We will you know, we'll interact with you over the phone or through email. Whatever works for you. Next slide. We start with the website. Well, we think this is beautiful. We have a great new website uh, coming out uh, in July. And we're working with a local group called FastSpot who's helping us with that. We're really excited. I think you'll find it to be incredibly helpful in your process. Next slide. Um, one of the things we have currently is if, if many of you are new or newer to the area, Discover Your Neighborhood is a very analytical way of looking at it. This is not a, I want to like, get up and go get coffee and feel this. Uh, this is very much the type of house you're looking for, the price range and amenities nearby. This, this tool on our website will help you with that. Next slide. Uh, the neighborhood profiles. This is the number one spot where people go to on our site. We have about 20,000 unique visitors every month. And what's unique about our neighborhood profiles is that they are written by the people who live there. So you are reading what it's like to live in that neighborhood by people who live there, reside there, etc. Next slide. So getting started, we have a really simple process on how to kind of get started. You saw kind of my first few questions I was going to ask you, but um, this is really kind of breaks down a little bit about the process. Next slide. Incentives. Uh, before I get into this, I, I want well, I want to say there's incentives that are based um, basically on the loan to buy the home or help with the down payment or closing costs. Maybe your employer participates in a program that would offer money, or you're looking you are that renovation person who won that middle house in this uh, the pictures of the homes. Maybe you want to look at historic preservation or um, some other homestead or homeowner tax credits. This is where people then, if, if they come in and they're standing in front of that map, kind of like eyes glazed over, this is the second area where their eyes kind of glazed over because while you see so many incentives, um, many of them are based on your income, where you're looking to buy, the house you're typing to buy, et cetera. And we can really help narrow those down so you don't feel like you have to go through each one of these. One of the things that will be on the new website is the um, ability to actually put some information in and it will filter it for you. And we're really excited about that. Um, the second thing about this is, before you start any of these incentives, please see one of the HUD, city approved, HUD approved homeownership counselors in Baltimore City. Um, neighborhood Housing Services is right over here on Park Avenue. Um, but there's many more like the Southeast CDC, Go Northwest. We encourage you, homeownership counseling is the best way. I don't know where all of you are from, but in Ohio, you did not get the keys to the car until you took driver's ed. We think that you shouldn't get the keys of the house until you have homeownership counseling. It's really, really important to understand what you're doing. Next slide. Um, and just to give you an idea, uh, a lot of incentives, you know, people think like, oh, I make too much, I make too little. Um, you'll see here that many of our incentives are either at 120% of the area median income or less. So if you are a single person and looking in that yellow column, uh, there are a lot of incentives based on that income. And so that's one of the things we'll sit down with you. So if you kind of feel that you're in those ranges, 80% AMI, we, we should be talking. 100%, uh, 120, we should be talking. You have a lot of opportunities uh, uh, out there for you. Next slide. Social media, it's really, really just easy just to hang out with us on Facebook and Twitter. We put everything there. You stay in touch with us. I know it's cliche, but we're really active on there. And it's one way for all of us to be talking. Next slide. So events, uh, this is kind of our big uh, to do twice a year, working with the Baltimore Housing Office of Home Ownership. Uh, we're doing it June 15th at Digital Harbor High School down in Federal Hill. And this is great. This money, $4,000, is no matter what your income is, no matter where you want to live, it is for everybody. We have um, opportunities for 30 individuals to get a $4,000 award for down payment or closing costs. If you're new to the area and you just want to kind of explore, we encourage you to come. We have great tours of neighborhoods. We really get in there like a local would. I know that's important. You kind of want to see where people are living. So we, we put a lot of time and effort into making sure that our tours are really keyed into what you're looking for. So 
I encourage you, anything, any questions you have for me today, either go to our website or I'll have um, Margo and Katie from my staff here that will also be able to answer questions. But um, I think that's it. Next slide. And there's our contact. We are open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. But obviously, if you call, leave a message, or email outside of business hours, we will get back to you right away. But um, so glad you're taking the first step of being here today. And we look forward to seeing you at Live Baltimore in the near future. Steve said he's going to have uh, people from his team here afterwards for lunch. So I, I mentioned to you that I had uh, moved from a little row house in Irvington to my new house. And when I bought the row house in Irvington 24 years ago, um, I didn't have a homeownership counselor. Uh, St. Ambrose Housing Aid Center is also here today. Um, and I, the only advice that I had was um, my father, who lived in Central Florida and didn't bother sitting for the ball, might help me with this. So I was walking around a bit blind. And I found the first mortgage loan officer that I could find. And it was clear to me that the mortgage loan officer thought of me as a deal and not a customer. I will tell you that when you're buying a home, you are uh, buying, of course, the place that you live. But if you are going to get a mortgage for that, you are borrowing a heck of a lot of money to pay for that home, to pay the seller for that house. Um, so imagine if I came to you and I said, hey, Steve, uh, I'm buying a house. It's 100000 Can you spot me 97 You get $97,000 I could borrow today? Well, Steve's looking at me like I just, you know, insulted him. But it's true. You're borrowing a lot of money. And so it's really important in your home buying process that you identify with and work with a mortgage company, a mortgage loan officer that you can talk to that will answer questions for you because this is a big part of the home ownership process. So I'm very, very pleased today to introduce uh, Ashley Ball from uh, PNC Mortgage, who's done a lot of work with first-time home buyers. Um, that's exemplified by the fact that she's awful busy these days helping a lot of people in the city buy. But she's going to walk you through the home buying process. And I'll tell you, the home buying process is a lot of things. It's sort of like riding a bike. The first couple of times you do it, it's like you're scared to death. Once you get to it, you know what you're doing. But this early part, this early exploration around the mortgage process is really important for you to focus on. So with that, Ashley, you want to come up and talk about buying a kingdom uh, mortgage? Sure. Good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. My name's Ashley. I'm with PNC Mortgage, as Will explained. Um, I'm a very proud Baltimore City native. Um, I actually take offense if you ask me if I'm from the county. It's kind of strange, but it's true. Um, I grew up in Hamilton in a house that was similar to the Victorian that you saw. Um, I had, it was five bedrooms, and we had foreign exchange students um, that were actually at Towson um, it, in the arts. So we had a house filled with, full with artists at all times. So this is kind of a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Then I moved to Canton, which is where I am now, um, in a rehab row home. So I can kind of uh, relate to both sides of the spectrum. Now, I'm just going to get it out of the way right away and uh, throw my nerd card on the table. So I find myself um, loving the dictionary. True story. Um, seriously, I look up words, like ordinary words, for fun and often. Um, so in preparation for today, I looked up the word home. Now, I use this word over 100 times today, a, a day, clearly, because of my job, um, and a lot of us do. But I haven't had to define it since probably elementary school. So home, a house, a shelter that is the usual residence of a person, family, or household, the physical structure in which one lives. But I think I like Webster's best way when he says it, the social unit formed by a family living together. Um, as Stephanie was saying earlier, I think it's important that that is what Baltimore is about. We're kind of a mixture of culture and, um, you know, different neighborhoods. Now, however you would like to define it, we all know that it's an important word, and it's a very big decision. And I'm truly excited to be here uh, this morning to share knowledge on the process of buying a home. So we can go to the slides. So home ownership is about building something for you as well as your family. Um, today we're going to speak a little bit on borrowing responsi responsibly as well as making the right decision for now as well as for the future. 
go to the next one. <laughs> so 10 reasons to own opposed to renting. Um, equity, savings for sure. Um, predictability, having that place to call home. Freedom, stability, um, build financial security. And most people, you know, don't realize that a large down payment is not necessarily uh, required any longer. Um, children have a better start in life. And then there's, of course, tax deductibility of interest. Um, and right now is pretty much the best time ever to buy. So why use a real estate agent, other than the fact that they have great personalities, like you'll see shortly? Um, it helps you assess wants and needs. It keeps your personal style in mind. Um, knowledge of all homes for sale in desired area. Um, they're going to help you with your negotiation. It gets you the right price, and it allows you to make your own decision. Helps protect your rights, and you know what? They don't even charge you anything. So benefits of a pre-approval. Now, this is very important because this is normally the first step in your process. So you can determine your purchase purchasing potential. So we'll have that initial conversation. Basically, um, what you're going to be able to afford and what works best for your needs. So what you're going to determine what your potential monthly payment may be, identify the loan programs that may fit your needs, and then also this is going to strengthen your offer. You might be sitting there wondering what questions to ask. Um, are they a mortgage banker or a direct lender? Or maybe they're a broker. Do you know the difference between the three of those? How long has the company been in business? What is their reputation? Do they lock in their interest rates? And for so, how long? And what does that even mean? <laughs> Go to the next one. Information you'll need to provide. Um, start gathering some of your information before you have that pre-approval conversation. So your residence history, um, your employment history, things like W-2s and things of that nature. Um, all outstanding loans and credit cards. Savings, checking, or investment accounts. Um, the real estate you currently own or personal property that you own. Steps through the loan process. Well, first, I'd like to say the pre-approval. But second, the loan application then there's going to be ordering documentation, the loan submission, the loan approval. Um, closing documents are then drawn, funding, and then lastly, recording. Oh, some of our loan highlights that we would love to discuss with you possibly out there. There's a lot of things like FHA loans. We have interest-only mortgages. There's VA loans for our veterans. Um, solutions for unique situations like say we're talking about today and we have several loan officers that are going to be outside that um, would love to share more information with you about say grant programs um, and just our different things that we offer here with PNC. Now there's three things that we'd like to tell you to remember and it's kind of easy because it's the three C's. So collateral, capacity, as well as credit. So when we're trying to determine what's best and what works best for your situation, we're going to be looking at the property that you're choosing, as well as your income, your employment history, uh, your credit history, your debts, as well as your assets. And all of this together will kind of form our decision with where we, how we move forward. So I get asked all the time, what's involved in closing costs? And it's, it's a common conversation, and I think it's probably one of um, the first ask. So it's, it's a form of um, different things that are going to be you know, calculated. So the loan origination fee, um, the loan discount, the appraisal fee, the credit report fee, the title insurance fees. You can see it's quite a few things that add up, but it's really not that much. And when we actually talk about it, you know, there's ways to actually um, get the closing costs down a considerable amount. What makes up your mortgage payment? Well, it's going to depend on um, what program that you actually choose, but the principal, the interest, the taxes, and insurance are the main four. Um, depending, you may have PMI, which is private mortgage insurance, FHA, you may have the mortgage insurance premium, or the VA, the funding fee. And this is all things that we could talk about. I know it sounds like a lot of acronyms. Now, after you buy the home, you may come back a, a few years from, from now and you want to know a little bit more about refinancing. 
Um, with refinancing, you're going to, you could have lower monthly payments. Um, you could consolidate the debt into the loan and lower or eliminate your balance on credit cards. Um, you could move from an adjustable rate to a fixed mortgage. Um, maybe something you know has changed in your life or, and you want to go down on term. Um, cash out some of the equity in your home to pay for college or another major expense. So this will be another conversation that you have a few years down the road from now, or months. Now we can... Any questions? Any questions? Or we can always answer them outside. <laughs> So you're asking not necessarily the length is yeah, stable? The, yeah, the length and, um, and also because for myself, I'm a head of dollars, mm -hmm. I'm self-employed. Sure. Um, your tax returns, that's normally the first thing that we're going to evaluate. So maybe you don't have the, um, the pay stubs or something of that nature that necessarily the W-2. Maybe you have a 1099 or um, just your tax returns in general. Well, they would also, I couldn't hear the first part of your question, but they also would look at when you finished um, school. So if there, if there isn't that, the two years, you know, maybe you're fresh out of um, school, they would look at that as well. Any other questions? Again, oh, we have a question here yet. Yeah, so if you are looking to buy a home where you would like Oh yeah, it's going to depend on the zoning, um, and they're going to actually, I believe, speak about that shortly. Um, so hopefully your answer will be, um, or they'll give you an answer shortly. There's a question in the back. Was the other one um, and income, yeah, yeah, and and debts as well. Question here. Sure. Well, with closing cost, um, I, sometimes the interest rate that you choose, um, you could get some of the closing costs down. Um, so, say you chose a little bit higher above par, um, you would be able to. Oh, what's that? Steve, you want to help me answer that question? Yeah. And I think that's where live Baltimore and, and the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland come back in. A lot of the incentives, when we say incentives, really are designed to lower your closing costs or down payment costs. So. If you're in a situation where the seller is going to pay your closing costs, that incentive could be then applied to your down payment. So the flexibility at the city and the state level is, is for that one purpose there, is that uh, most uh, will help with those two areas, which is probably going to be the, the biggest part uh, of where your money will come out of your pocket, other than taking on the mortgage.
No, it's not the only way. I think every transaction is different, but in the situation with incentives, they, having the flexibility that they can be applied as a and or um, it means that if it's in a situation where the seller was to pay your closing costs, then you could take that whole incentive and put it um, to draw down your down payment. Um, if you have, if you are obligated to bring some money for closing costs, you could use that incentive to reduce your obligation. And a lot of times, our incentives uh, only require a thousand dollars out of your pocket. So it's really um, you will have to bring money to the table, but you may not you may have to take five thousand dollars out of your savings. We will at the incentive, like our $4,000 uh, incentive on June 15th, that could be applied towards closing cost or down payment or make sure both. Any other questions? Yeah. A lot of us artists aren't interested in traditional houses per se because we use heavy machinery, but we want to live with our machinery because some of us just work around the clock. What kind of loans and things are available for people? You know, some of us might weld and fix cars or create things. Are there loans for people like that that, that, that want to live and work in a space, but they're not traditional houses or row homes? They're like retired gas stations, firehouses, and things like that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like the mayor said, it's Baltimore, so we, we live in a lot of places here. Um, you know, one of the big things with the, the, the city and state of Maryland's incentives is that it has to be a primary residence. And so that we're going to start there. Uh, we, we acknowledge that there's live workspaces. Um, most of the incentives can be used to units that hold up to four residential units, as long as you're living in one of those. Um, as it pertains to unique spaces, that's where you have to have a conversation with um, Baltimore Housing or the state of Maryland DHCD or, you know, live Baltimore or a mixture because um, I think we get that these opportunities are out there, and we just want to make sure, um, you know, obviously we, we're not, I, I doubt the city's going to allow you to use an incentive to go right into a gas station that hasn't been remediated. So before you do that, please pick up the phone and call either Live Baltimore or Baltimore Housing, but um, we, we do recognize that these opportunities are out there, and, and each of our organizations will work with you to address that. We, we definitely want to make it a, a, a possibility, but at the same time, we want to make sure that it's, it's legal and legitimate. And, and your answer really relates to financing. To Steve's point, most mortgage financing is around a primary residence. But when you're talking about financing for equipment and things, that's a separate type of financing. Not equipment, just the environment. Just okay, the work so, environment. And again, so if the, if the building is not zoned residential, as Steve said, it's a different thing. And so sometimes you may not technically be able to leave in that type of, live in that type of building that you want to live in. So you might need to go through some zoning changes and things like that. So. It's different than a traditional residential property, and it just takes a lot more research on your part, but there's resources to help you get there. Or can I add, you're talking more of a mixed-use commercial, yeah. Yeah. which would be a different product right. than a traditional mortgage. Question in the back. So that's where, I mean, that's where, again, the mortgage company is going to have to look at your income. And if you're not declaring a whole lot of income to the federal government, you can't turn around and say to the bank, well, that's actually not my income. So you are going to have to sort of think about that now and over the long haul. And that's why maybe having a conversation with either a mortgage loan officer now or a home ownership counselor now to help you think about, well, maybe home ownership isn't a reality today, but in two years or a year and a half it may be. So you can rethink about how you're presenting your income so that you can then qualify for that mortgage loan that you're looking for.
And with that, I'm going to ask further questions be taken over the lunch hour out front because I am on a time, a time crunch. So I apologize for that, but we will have plenty of resources. Ashley, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. So um, I sort of told you a little story about my home, own home buying experiences. And I've been really fortunate in my two times that I've actually bought a house in which the, the person that sort of got me through it was my realtor. I'm still very loyal to my realtor. Um, I've referred my realtor out a number of times. I'm lucky that way. I'm like my first mortgage experience where I didn't have someone I could talk to. I had my realtor to guide me through it. Um, the, aside from a lot of the resources that we've already heard about, the, the person who's going to be in the middle of your home ownership transaction, provided you are using a realtor, is, is that person. And we're really fortunate today to have two realtors to sort of walk through what it means to work with a realtor, what their role is in the transaction. I think they're part deal maker. I think they're part therapist. I know I rely on my realtor for therapy when I did that. But um, I'd like to introduce Liz Etzel and Chi Yan from Keller Williams to come up and talk about what it means to be working with a realtor. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Liz Etzel. I'm with Keller Williams Realty in Baltimore, and I have been in the business for six years, and I tell you, I have seen it all. I specialize in first-time home buyers, sellers, short sales, REOs, and I even work with renters. I have lived in Baltimore City for 10 years, and I feel now like I am a true Baltimorean. So I'm really excited to be here, and I work with Chi as well. We've worked together for several years, and I'll let him introduce himself to you. Hi, uh, my name's Chi, and uh, like Liz, I'm with Keller Williams Realty Baltimore. Uh, before that, a little quick story. I was uh, born in Hong Kong, moved to the States uh, with my family back in 1983 when I was nine years old. Uh, if you were born morning, I went to Cross Country Elementary School in the middle of fourth grade, and went to Falstaff Middle School for sixth and seventh grade. I like to tell people I learned uh, English through uh, He-Man and G.I. Joe. <laughs> So, uh, I have the power. Um, <laughs> fast forward, uh, I went to the University of Baltimore and I uh, got a bachelor's degree in business administration. And um, after that, I worked for a real estate title company for 11 years where I uh, helped uh, clearing a lot of titles, which uh, we're talking about today. Before you buy a house, how to clear a title, make sure everything's paid off. And then uh, after 11 years, I became an agent four years ago. So, uh, like Liz, I help with a lot of first-time home buyers, and uh, we're here to help you. And also, um, Chi, his, his daughter is so cute. I just wanted to say, he posted this picture on Facebook today for Mother's Day. And I said to him, oh my gosh, Chi, who took that photo? It was his wife and daughter. And what did you say? Uh, yeah, I took it on my cell phone. And, I was uh, shocked. It looked like professional quality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, cell phones nowadays... There's great apps out there, you know, it's, I just post it. And so, I mean, I was wondering, not to cut you off, I was wondering because he did such a good job and I mean, we're Facebook friends, we've been friends and I always see these really great photos and so I was wondering, my friend is getting married and I know she's on a tight budget and I mean, would you be willing to, you know, do the <laughs> photography for her wedding? I mean, you're really good at it. I would love to do it. I mean, it would mean, be would my be, first wedding, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know it would be your first wedding, but, like, she would be so excited because I know, you know, she's on a budget. Yeah, I mean, the, the app itself has a lot of features. It's got a uh, black and white. Uh, it can do uh, vintage. Oh, wow. It can, it can do uh, warm vintage. It can do uh, cool vintage. So I mean, she is going to be so excited. I can't wait to tell her about this. And also, I can do, do videos at the same time. So Seriously? It'll be all in one, one package, yeah. Oh yeah. my God, she is going to be thrilled. I cannot wait to tell her. I cannot wait. I'll just go through my schedule and make sure that uh, I'm available that afternoon. Fantastic. So obviously, guys, we're kidding. Uh, what the point is, is that if you are going to take professional photos, you want to consult with a professional photographer. And if you're looking to buy or sell a home, you want to consult with a professional real estate agent. So we're talking about the benefits of using a realtor. Next slide, please. And this is us, our lovely photos. And our signs are out there so you can drive around the city and see pictures of myself and Chi all over. Next slide, please. All right, so um, 
the main reasons why you want to use a realtor is uh, number one, you know, looking online without realtor or the multiple listing service, um, you want to save time. Um, I know some of you, probably some of you have gone to uh, look on Trulia or Zillow. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, the main thing I would say is that uh, those websites are not on time. Meaning that uh, Liz and I get calls all the time working with, uh, with buyers. Hey, Liz, um, there's a house on 123 Main Street. What's up with that? And then lo and behold, when we research it, it's been sold a month ago. So uh, that's the advantage of uh, using a realtor like us. So that all the information that we email you that day, automatically search, sent to you that day, that hour, that minute, it's uh, the most uh, accurate information. Uh, Touring open houses, how many, how many of you have been to open houses in the neighborhood? Okay, so there's nothing wrong with that. You want to see what the neighborhood provides and what the house looks like in those neighborhoods. Um, but you can only go to probably one or two on that afternoon. Versus uh, Liz and I, what we can do is, of course, do our buy consultation and we'll sit down and really send you all the active listings in that neighborhood and then we'll schedule 68 of them to see that one morning or one afternoon so that you get a true sense of what's out there in today's market. And the uh, knowledge of expertise about the market and pricing, uh, of course, comparable homes and what to offer. If you were to find a house that one uh, afternoon, you want to say, gee, I want to put an offer in that house, we will then sit down and go through, okay, what are homes being sold in the last three months uh, in, in that neighborhood with similar square footage, bedrooms, bathrooms, because uh, at the, when we give you the information, then you'll, be, you'll feel comfortable of the price that uh, you'll be offering at. Next slide. So once you find that perfect property, you say, Liz or Chi, I want to write a contract. That's fantastic. So what's next? Well, we are going to literally walk, walk you through this process. I mean, these contracts are between 30 and 60 pages. And it's a lot to decipher, especially, you know, you're not a real estate professional. We do this all day, every day. We're constantly going through contracts with people, reviewing contracts, so we can really sit down with you and go by paragraph by paragraph so that you know exactly what you're getting into. Can you get out of the contract? Are there contingencies? What you, you just need to know what's going on, and it's really difficult to do that if you don't have someone representing you and looking out for your best interest. Um, again, who is representing and negotiating on your behalf? If you go to that open house and you really like that house, the agent that's there, they legally cannot represent you because they represent the seller. So you really need to have someone who's on your side looking out for your best interests and really negotiating and representing on your behalf. Next slide, please. So home inspection. Within the contract that we're going to write, there's going to be a home inspection contingency. Um, that inspector uh, is going to go, go from literally roof to the basement and inspect every little thing that the house uh, is going to have. Either it's good condition or it needs work or it needs repair. So within the contract itself, after the home inspection, the home inspector is going to give us a report, email us a report, and we're going to go through the list of things that we might want to ask, ask the seller to fix. Now, mechanical, structural versus cosmetic, we want to ask the most important stuff up front. I would say probably keep it in a single digit of list of things you want, we want the seller to fix because if we ask for 25 things while well, the seller looks at the list and probably don't want to even want to look at that list because all they see is dollar signs. So we want to make sure that we ask for things like uh, the, the heat is not heating, the, the air conditioning is not cooling, the window is not closing, uh, the pipe is leaking, things like that, that really affects the functionality of the house. Um, and uh, what to ask for, for, for the repairs, again, we want to make sure that uh, we ask for the most important stuff because the seller has every opportunity to say, I would fix all five things, I'll fix three to five things, or I will fix nothing. So whatever answer comes back from the seller, I'll definitely discuss that with you. Uh, monitor the loan process, of course, constant communication with Ashley. Uh, that uh, making sure that all the loan process, all the documents that you're getting, uh, it's in. Uh, if you're getting grants, of course, uh, contacting the uh, housing uh, uh, counselor to make sure that you, you've done all the credit classes, getting all the right grants that, uh, so that at the end of the day, at Solomon Table, there are no surprises. Uh, title company and title examination, as I said before, I used to work for the title company. Um, there, we are the, the realtors are there to find your house. The lenders to lend you the money. The title company is the legal part of the transaction. So that 
at the end of the day, when the title company clears or find out what liens and judgments uh, against the property, all those things have to be paid off, uh, released, because before you sign on a dotted line, they have to be gone before you take title. Um, and you do have to pay a title uh, insurance, that's a one-time title insurance fee. You have to pay yours and you have to pay the lenders, okay? You, have to, you don't have to pay that, but we recommend you paying that because one day, two years from now, a grandson of the person said, well, this is my grandfather's house, I'm entitled to part of this transaction two years ago. Then you file a claim against the title company and they will defend you on that because if you don't pay that title insurance, uh, you have to do everything yourself. Um, and ground rent, fee simple. Uh, fee simple, basically you own the structure of the property and then the land itself, ground rent. Uh, in a nutshell, it's, uh, it's back in Cologne days. They own the land. They allow people to put uh, build buildings on top of property and you pay rent, okay, on top of, uh, on their land. And in today's standard, it's about anywhere from 40 bucks to probably $180 as the most, but you only pay that twice a year. Uh, don't worry about you know not owning the land. It's you have every opportunity to buy that ground rent now if you want to, and if we know who that ground rent holder is. If we don't, the title company take care of it. They collect an escrow, and uh, we'll we'll make the transaction happen. Mm -hmm. So I just quickly wanted to go through these steps with you because I think there's a misconception about what a real estate agent does. I think when I tell people that I'm a real estate agent, they're like. Well, I'm so jealous, you get to look at homes all day and it's so much fun. And yes, it is. But there is a huge process that goes behind it. So just quickly, you know, in the beginning stages for you all as first time home buyers, we really need to sit down so she and I can analyze your goals, your needs, what neighborhoods you wanna be in, um, and just kind of get a concise uh, knowledge of what, what you want. Then we're going to do the research for you. We're going to pull those listings that are best suited for you so that we're not wasting your time and we're not wasting our time. We're going to review the properties, show you the properties, help you compare and evaluate the different properties. Then once we find that one, we're going to write the offer. We're going to negotiate the offer on your behalf. Uh, you know, communicate with Ashley, your lender, and make sure that all of your documents are in. Then what we do, once we uh, have all those negotiations agreed upon, we call it contract to closing. So we're essentially really the glue that holds everything together because we're communicating with you, with the seller's agent, with the lender, with the title company, making sure that everyone gets the documents they need in a timely fashion. And it's really important to have that realtor behind you putting it all together because without us, it's gonna be quite difficult, honestly. Next slide, please. So there's different types of sales. Um, there's the standard sale, meaning that uh, regular title holder, homeowner who wants to put their house on the market and put on the market with a listing agent, and uh, that's one part of the tra type of transaction. The easiest part. Very easy. <laughs> um, short sale, uh, how many know what short sales are? How many do not know what short sales are? Okay, short sales are really small houses, like tiny houses. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I need a, we need a laugh sometimes. Uh -huh. um, short sale, there, it's not a short process. Uh, again, short sales, basically what's going on is that um, the homeowner who's lived in the house are in that distressed situation. They lost their job, something's happened to them where they cannot make their monthly payment all, on time or at all. So they bought the house by peak of the market and they owe, let's say, $200,000. But the market in that neighborhood, on that block, on that street, is probably 150000 So there's no way for them to put it on the market and to pay off their mortgage. So they need to contact a real estate agent to say, listen, I need your help to market this property for me and put it as a short sale. So that at the end of the day, um, a buyer will come to uh, write an offer on the short sale. With that contract, they will submit with a short sale package proving the seller, it's in a short sale situation, submitted to the seller's lender for them to review. Um, and the lender will take, we will put in our contract 90 days for them to review everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes longer. So um, short sale are not short process, actually one of the longest process that you can go through. Mm -hmm. You can have good deals on it, but I would say you have to be very patient on it because within the 90 days or how many days we're waiting for the lender to come back to us, 
we cannot look for another house. We're not going to submit another uh, offer on another property because you are committed to that house. Um, and they're so as is because since the sellers do not have any money to make the mortgage payment, they're selling the house as, as is. So the home inspection that you're going to do, whatever problem that comes up, um, it's, on you. it's on you. And same thing as with the foreclosure in REO, bank owned. Uh, at that point, uh, they foreclosed on the property. The bank actually owns the property. And uh, same thing, it's sold as is. Now, a lot of times, um, it's not as short as the, the answer getting, you're getting uh, from an offer. Uh, you get it, we'll probably get it within a week, okay? Uh, right now, there's not as many uh, foreclosures and, and uh, REOs out there because a lot of people are doing more short sales than before they go into foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So now we have our frequently asked questions, and these are questions that people ask she and I all the time. Number one, the biggest concern that buyers have is who pays the realtor? You know, you may not have a lot of money for your down payment, and you're thinking, well, if I hire a real estate agent, do I pay them? Well, lucky for you, and Ashley touched upon this, nine out of 10 times, the seller is paying all of the real estate commission. And if for some reason, the seller says, I'm not paying that buyer's agent, we will know as soon as we see that house because they have to put it in the description. And if that's the case, then you and I will sit down and we'll figure something out. But like I said, that seller, nine out of 10 times, is paying all of the commission. So essentially, you're getting free representation and you're not paying for anything. Um, there, most, most companies do have an admin fee that you'll pay, which is only a couple hundred dollars to the office, but that's standard for any company. Um, another question, you know, can you save money by not using a realtor? It's a misconception that if you go to an open house and you use that agent that you might save money because that agent might tell you, hey, you're going to save money because there's only one agent involved. But like I said, that agent cannot legally represent you. So they're going to go back to the seller and say, well, I'm doing double the work, so I'm taking all the commission. So you're not only not, not only are you not saving money, but you're not getting represented and you're probably spending too much money because your agent's going to say, you know, you shouldn't pay for that, the seller should pay for that. So it's really a good idea to have a realtor. And closing costs. You know, we're gonna look at several different properties, we'll narrow it down to two or three, and we'll say house A, B, and C. We'll send it to your lender, and one of them might be a condo, one of them might be a single family, and one might be a townhome. All of them have different taxes, some, some might have HOA fees, and your lender can take those and put them in a scenario and say, this is what your closing costs will be, this is what your monthly payment will be. And then we can analyze and see, you know, which house really is the best fit for you. Also, um, I know that he had touched upon this, do you qualify for any grant programs? Well, if you're not working with a professional, you may not know that based on your occupation or what neighborhood that you want to live in, there may be tons of grant programs and you wouldn't know because you're not working with someone. So she and I, as well as your lender, can advise you on any programs that you may qualify for. And lastly, how long does the home process buying uh, take? Well, from our initial meeting, it's gonna take anywhere from one to three months to, for us to sit down, analyze your goals, and find that perfect house. And once we do that, and we write that contract, and we get it under, under contract, and everything's good, from that point, if it's a standard sale, it's gonna take 30 to 45 days to close. Like she said, if it's a short sale, you're looking at 90 to 180 days. But in a standard situation, it's about 30 to 45 days. So you can say about one to four and a half months for the whole process. Unless you're on an accelerated pace and we'll work with you if you need that help too. Next slide, please. So thank you guys so much. If you guys have any other questions, we can answer some now. If we have time, if not, we'll be outside. You can look for our pictures because we brought our signs. <laughs> any questions? Questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, Actually, that's a great question. Um, the owner, when they list the house, there's a form that they fill out that says, we do or do not know of any latent defects. So if they know of something, like there's mold behind this wall, or we used to have water in the basement, by law, they're required to list that on the property. And your inspector will be able to go and he'll do all the tests needed to determine if there's issues with that house. 
But like you said, the seller would know if there's something wrong with the house because they live there. And by law, they're required to disclose that information when you write that offer. So if you, two years down the road, you find something, you go back to them, and indeed you find out that they never told you that, well, then they would be liable. And, and Well, I'll, I would say Liz and I have uh, inspectors that we recommend quite often. Uh, I know the inspector that I use, uh, I mean, if you can see, if I can quote it, I mean, it's the most detailed inspection report that can be, there can be. Mm -hmm. I would say there, there has to be a limitation as to what they can inspect. It's really the spaces they can, they can crawl to, mm -hmm. you know. They'll, they'll crawl to any, any attic, any, anything under the house. They'll do anything and everything except, you know, there's a wall behind it. I, I had a home buyer where, he found out that there's termite behind this crawl space in the basement, you know, beyond where anyone can go. And he asked me, well, what can we do? Uh, can I contact the, the, the home inspector or termite inspector? Because there's, there's going to be termite inspection too, mm -hmm. to make sure that there's no visual termite damage. So there's a limitation, but uh, they, they try and do the best of their job. If something comes up, you know, down the line, it's one of those things where you, you have to, you know, make a decision what you want to do. You want to take it legally to to, to the sellers or whatever, or you want to just move on and, and contact your homeowner's insurance and take care of it. Mm -hmm. Question behind her. Yes. I was just wondering how the process changes when you're purchasing a vacant that's either owned by a, um, a owner or the city. We're talking about vacancy yeah. value in a minute, but if, um, let's just say it's a private owner. Right. Mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, um, we need to know who the owner is, so we know, uh, kind of touched on title, you know, when we, when we transfer title to you, that the owner is notified that they are going to sell the house to you. Um, you know, all, the, all, the, all the properties that we're going to show you, we know who the owner is, let's just say that, okay? It's not like, hey, there's an empty house all boarded up. Hey, she, can you find out what's going on with that one? Yeah, the, the homes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The homes that we're going to be showing you, we have the contact information. We know we have all the documents, so we'll be able to get that from contract to close. Whereas if it's just some random vacant lot or, or boarded up house, it might be difficult for us to figure out. It might take a really long time. And I want to touch on a point where I think a lot of you have is that, well, I, I'm looking for a mixed use or a property that I want to fix up. At the end of the day is whatever financing that you're getting, mm -hmm. that the lender will know that at one point or some point in the future, this house will be in a livable condition. Mm -hmm. Okay, either it's livable condition now, or they need to know how the financing will, will be you know, put together so that when the work's gonna be done to rehab the house or rehab the building or fi fix it up, that it's going to be in a livable condition. Okay, you cannot buy a house where there's lead based paint peeling, no. uh, plumbing, you know, it's, there's mold in the basement. Yeah, you, know, you won't get financing for it. There's, there's a hole in the, you know, on the roof. Uh, if there are, that, that's fine, but you need to get the proper financing to make sure that all those things are fixed because they, they have an interest to it uh, to lend you the money. Got a question over here? Yeah. Yes. You mean after we're under contract? Well, you said it's a process where it has to go to the lender, yes. and they have to look at it and kind of decide whether or not they're going to accept your offer. Mm -hmm. But if there's a situation because the buyer has this hardship, if they no longer have a hardship and they kind of just want to take it out of circulation, like, does that happen? Or? Well, legally, let's just say this, they sign a contract. Yeah. They sign a contract to sell you a house. So there's legal, uh, obligation of that and if they decide not to sell the house no different than any other seller who just pulled out then then there's legal repercussion of them not going through the whole process mm -hmm. so uh, I mean they're in a distressed situation where it's very rare that on a short sale they saw also only yeah. only reason only case I can think of is they won the lottery I was just gonna <laughs> they say, win the lottery, win the lottery and... maybe but then they'll probably buy something in Miami <laughs> <laughs> questions <laughs> Say your question again, I'm sure. How can you tell if a home is in or about to go into foreclosure? 
we have a system with our multiple lists that we can look it up, but usually that list agent will call and have a conversation with them and ask them, you know, where are you guys in this short sale process? Are you about to be in foreclosure? Uh, what has the bank said? When's the last time that you talked to the bank? So we'll have that conversation before we even put the offer in to make sure that we're not getting ourselves into a bad situation. Is there any way that a regular person can get that information? I don't think that you can... Find out if they're yeah. going to be for, being foreclosed on? Right. I mean, if you can... You know, with a, you can log log or register yourself with the Maryland Land Records in Baltimore City or the whole state of Maryland, and you know, diligently diligently find out that specific property and and what's recorded against it. I mean, you can, but it's, yeah, it's, it's public it's, knowledge. But it's kind of hard to find. Yeah, it's, it's not easily found. I mean, re, once they get foreclosed on, sometimes it takes a year, two yeah. years, three years before before that property comes back on the market as a foreclosure listing because. Um, as you guys know, the banks nowadays, they might sell that the whole bunch of properties to another bank and, and uh, they have to assign and negotiate it to that property because it might be in Texas and you don't, we, we need someone to talk to, to, to buy this property or for you to buy this property. So if we don't have a contact to the lender, there's no way for us to, number one, see the property, number two, yeah. to talk to that, that, that negotiator to, to have you buy that property, so. Any other questions? Again, our fabulous realtors are going to be out uh, front today over lunchtime. Thank you all for a really terrific presentation. So, <clears throat> you learned a lot about um, A resources live Baltimore. You learned a lot about kind of there's a bit of the mechanics to a mortgage loan. You learned a lot about writing contracts. And there's all of these resources to help you. One of those things that we have here in our city is we have a housing department run by Commissioner Graziano is here today. And they have been charged with and are doing a terrific job of figuring out how is it we can slowly and methodically start chipping away at a vacant housing issue that we have in the city. Remember, our city was built roughly for a million people, give or take, and now we're 650,000, give or take. So we have vacant houses here. And um, as the mayor said earlier that she had heard at the cultural town hall that vacant houses might be a, a, a great thing to introduce to the cultural community, which is one of the reasons why we're here today. So to talk about the mayor's initiative that's run uh, by the housing department, Vacancy Value, I have Julie Day and Ken, are you gonna come up? Julie Day and Ken Strong are gonna come up um, to uh, Deputy Housing Commissioner, to talk about what vacancy to value is and how you or people you know uh, can gain access to vacant houses that are owned by the city. Thank you. Thanks, Will. As Will mentioned, my name is Julie Day. I'm one of the Deputy Commissioners for Housing. And I'd like to thank Will and our friend Frank for hosting us, for Brooke and Bill and uh, Randy for helping us get organized and having another opportunity to share the information about Mayor Rawlings Blake's blade elimination initiative called vacants to value as the mayor graciously pointed out there are a number of our team members here Teresa Stevens Howard Tutman Mike Guy Art Gray um, there is also uh, Janine Dunn and of course our housing commissioner Paul Graziano who is just a tremendous leader in all the housing efforts we have across the city but particularly with the vacants to value program and I thank him for his leadership and for being here this morning Vacants to Value was launched in the November of 2010 as Mayor Rollins Blake's idea of how do we eliminate blight in the, um, I don't know how we get you to do, I'll just snap, how's that work? Um, you know, there's a lot of blight along this, across the city, I'll talk about the scope of the problem in a second, but what we tried to do to address the blight differently under the, um, the Vacants to Value is really streamline the disposition process the main reason we're here today, how do we get the inventory that we own, the city owns, all the vacant buildings and vacant lots we own, how do we get them into your hands and back into productive use more quickly, more predictably, more transparently? We work with our partners um, in code enforcement led by Deputy Commissioner Michael Braverman to streamline code enforcement. And in a really innovative way, we've come up with development block clusters where um, we partner with both for-profit and not-for-profit developers to identify a footprint 
where they're going to commit their capital, we're going to commit our resources, and we're going to be sure that we have a whole block solution. We get rid of every vacant building within that footprint. And you can see that really robustly um, underway, in particularly around the area where Hopkins campus is and the East Baltimore development, which really spawned that activity as, um, I'll skip ahead, with large-scale reinvestment. Not to leave you out. The, um, but really, when there's so much distress in an area, the city really has to just invest a lot of capital, massive infusion of capital. It's too big for a developer to do, and you'll see that in areas such as Park Heights or Poppleton um, in Barclay, um, just real near here. And then the developers come along and they say, hey, here's an opportunity, here's a strength that the city's helping build. We're willing now to invest in that area, and those are our development clusters. We have targeted incentives that my, my friend Ken Strong, the Deputy Commissioner here with me, he is the Deputy Commissioner of Healthy Green Homes and Sustainable Homes. He Actually, Ken has the most fun job, I think, in our agency because he really, I mean, he gives immediate help to folks. He'll talk about the home buyer incentives, but really when it, you get to weatherization and how can you go into somebody's home and say, you know what, I can cut your costs, I can help you every month. And, you really get to put it together. I'm, I'm a little jealous sometimes because it seems like it's really fun. Um, not that my job's not fun. Um, and then the third, the last strategy is what do we do with the houses that we have in our inventory that we don't really have a plan for? How do we keep them clean and secure? How do we find money um, to demolish them? I'm happy to say that we will, under, again, under the leadership of Mayor Rollins Blake, taking a really aggressive approach to demolition. She's committed um, over the next 10 years close to $100 million to use for demolition, and is actually making a commitment to President Clinton, his global initiative, to do a number of those demolitions. So it's a pretty exciting time for eliminating blight, which doesn't sound really like it goes together. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the scope of our problem. We have about 16,000 vacant buildings in the city. Now, those are the buildings you'll see that are boarded up. Um, they have been inspected by one of our housing inspectors and found to be not, you can't live in it, it's not fit for habitation. Um, one of the things I really take, enjoy taking the opportunity to point out is the city only owns about 20% of those. We have about 3,000 of the 16,000. The rest of them are privately owned. It doesn't mean we can't find a remedy. In fact, under vacants to value, we bring all the, all the different um, divisions of the agency to find exactly the right fit on a block-by-block -block focused strategy. But, but it's a real misunderstanding of a lot of folks that all the vacant buildings are owned by the city. They're not. We do own enough to sell you one, though. So let's move to that. So what are the benefits of buying a vacant building? You know, especially with you guys, where you, you know, the, the vision is just limitless. Your ideas are limitless. You have a blank slate. You can... Sometimes you'll buy a building from us, it may have a roof, it may not. As uh, Teresa Stevens, our director of marketing, um, is quick to point out, you know, it's airy and light <laughs> with high ceilings. Um, so, you know, you just let your imaginations run wild. Um, and how do you find our properties? We have on our website at baltimorehousing.org a, it is .org, right? <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> um, you can search for our properties that way, either by neighborhood, by address, by zip code, by all different sorts of things, and it has photos. If you click on the photo, it gives you details about the properties. On this page, you can also find out how to tap into um, some of our resources, the, the incentives, how to, there's an application online, and there's, it's, it's a pretty useful tool. We're always open to cr criticism or suggestions to make it more usable and, and uh, better for everybody. But this is where you would start to look for our, for our properties. Um, again, we, an important thing that Teresa really has done, and I commend her and her team, the marketing team we have at Housing, we have a resource center. Come down to 417 East Fayette Street, where our housing department is located, and walk, st stop in, make an appointment or just drop in, and one of our agents will work with you, not unlike the folks that had just finished talking with us 
about how do you buy one of the properties. They'll find the neighborhood that's right for you, they'll find the spot for you, and even if you do win the lottery, we will find the place where you will want to stay in Baltimore. Not Miami. <laughs> um, you know, Facebook, always a great place. We've got a lot, of, it's a pretty robust site where folks write in questions. Um, we get information out that way. We have a lot of our events advertised on, on Facebook for you as well. A couple of different ways to buy properties from us, just to open bid. You can find properties on the website, as I mentioned. We have open house tours. Um, occasionally, we'll put out a request for proposal. That's generally, if it's a larger parcel, probably not necessarily what you're looking for, though we will be offering some things. This, one of the things we're kicking around, I'll give you a little, um, a little leak here. Um, we're going to be having this summer, we're going to be calling it the Summer Sizzler Sale. And we're going to have a lot of like the properties that are kind of unique, and we get a a, um, a a bit of interest about something, some that you might be interested, in, like a surplus firehouse. You know, how cool would that be? You know, um, we have some schools, we have some different different parcels that are a little bit bigger, a little give some unique opportunities. So keep an eye out for for that opportunity. We'll be advertising those soon. Um, but a request for proposal would be, but we're here in Station North. And on Greenmount West, the 1700 block of Greenmount West, as you see it now, it's a big open lot. Actually, it has a little tent in it and a little men's club there. Um, but we have a request for proposals where we're looking for some uh, a new apartment or a multifamily dwelling to go there. So that's how we get um, solicit our bids. If you want to buy the yard next to us, next to your house, if you're an owner occupant, we'll sell it to you for five hundred dollars. You know, on the rim and out the door. Um, we'd rather you cut the grass than call us when it's high, and we, if you want to own it and cut it, thank you. <laughs> um, an open bid, as I mentioned, we just have, you know, you can find the application online or in our office, and we have a table out in the back that has a list of all of our available properties, and we probably have applications out there, I don't know, somebody can say yes or no. Yes. Yes, we have applications outside if you're ready to buy this morning. Um, when we get an application, we advertise it on the web for two weeks to see if anybody else you know, might take an interest and counter your offer, make it better, and uh, then we decide who gets to be reviewed for qualifications. You have to have the capacity to do it financially. You have to have um, the ability to do it either yourself or through contract. And we want to make sure that your project is a success both for the community where we're trying to eliminate the blight, but we don't want to set you up for failure either. So our, our marketing agents work with you really closely to get the application right, find the right property for you, and help you get through um, the process of rehab, because all of our properties do need a fair amount of work. Um, I'll turn to Ken for a second. Ken Strong's going to talk about incentives for men, and I'll be right back. Thanks, Julie. And, um, let, let's pause for one second to um, uh, give a recognition to Will Backstrom for putting this whole uh, program together. He has done a fantastic job, the whole PNC uh, team. Um, Mayor Rawlings Blake and Commissioner uh, Graziano, Julie Day, have um, talked about the vacancy value program. One of our home ownership incentives is a $10,000 down payment and closing cost assistance for the purchase of a rehabilitated uh, vacant house. Um, a number of them are listed on baltimorehousing.org. Uh, we have uh, four or five dozen of them that you can look at. It's not limited to that, that list, but if it's a qualified uh, vacant to value house, you can get that much assistance in down payment and closing costs. Michael Guy, who is our Director of Home Ownership, runs that program for Baltimore Housing. He's here this morning. The other home ownership incentive that I wanted to highlight, and Steve Gondel talked about the whole range of them. Live Baltimore is a great place to go to look at the whole range of city, state, and community incentives. But the other is the Live Near Your Work program. And if your employer contributes $2,500 to your purchase of a, a home, the city will match that $2,500. And that's a $5,000 uh, combined incentive as a grant. So we encourage you, if your employer is not enrolled already in the program, consider asking them to. If you are an employer yourself, enroll in the program. 
Art Gray, who's our special projects coordinator, is here this morning, and he'll help you through that process. Thank you very much. So this is pretty much what Ken just talked about. Now I feel like the mayor. Um, so what we really want you to do is see the potential of all the houses. And one of the, here's another little trick our uh, team came up with. How many of our houses need rose-colored glasses? So if you come on one of our tours, you can get your own pair of rose-colored glasses and see the potential. Um, one of the questions earlier was about how to get the work done. Um, we have a series of workshops throughout the year that help you, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we really want you to succeed, and how can we you know, best help you do that? So this series of workshops is how do you buy a house? How do you get the proper permits? Because we don't want you to get in trouble with our friends in the permit office. How do you um, take advantage of all the incentives? And the most... Um, the next one we have, I must say the most recent, but let's not go backwards. Um, next week, May 22nd, is how do you buy, how do you rehab with a 203K loan? And a two, do you guys offer 203K? Um, the, a 203K loan allows you to take a mortgage out for the value of the house after it's rehabbed. So even though you may only pay, you know, three or four, maybe 5000 on a good day for us, for one of our houses, it's going to cost you a hundred or one hundred and fifty or one hundred and eighty thousand dollars to do the work, depending on the size of the house. So the two hundred three k loan covers that full amount, but you have to work with a HUD certified contract. You have to go through the home buying counseling. But if you come to this workshop, um, we'll walk you through the steps of how to how to tap into that um, mortgage program and and. With the types of, you know, the kind of studio space, the kind of unique spaces you might want to come up with, I would really encourage you to come to this and uh, learn how to get one of those loans. Um, our next feature property is on Tuesday the 21st. Come take a look at that at Ridgewood out in um, Dolefield neighborhood, which is out off of Racerstown Road, Park Heights Avenue. Um, really, really solid block. It's a 90% owner occupied. and. Um, that one looks like it's pretty solid, so if you want to take a look out in that neighborhood, please do. We'll give you a pair of glasses. <laughs> but they only need to be pink. Um, so here, just take a look. You know, this is some of the work we've done, or some of our partners have done along the way. Um, before and after shots of properties. This is a great block. This is on the, the 1200 block of North Bond Street. You can see that our photographer captured it perfectly. Before and after. The basketball courts, huh? Um, Broadway, I don't know if any of you have been over into Oliver lately. I'd encourage you to do that if you like the smell of sawdust. It's in the air this time of year. Um, lots of really fabulous rehabs going on on that Grand Boulevard that leads down all the way down into Fells Point. We never really thought anybody would be able to make use of those buildings without uh, some real wild work. And they're ready for sale now. This, is a, this picture's a bit dated. And then lastly, I would encourage you to uh, come to our Baltimore Builds Expo on June 8th. Now this is, as I mentioned, the series of workshops that we offer. This, this is a day long, filled with uh, workshops, exhibitors, bankers, um, contractors, all sorts of people there in, in one place. It's gonna be at Coppin State University this year. We generally have three or 400 people come. Um, Home Depot comes and does demonstrations, how to spackle, how to paint, how to do different um, types of work if you want to do it yourself. There's online registration for the first time. We just got that hooked up. And I'd really like to see you all back there figuring out how to uh, make a vacant your home. Thank you very much. Any questions for a vacancy value? Any questions in the back? The, as for the time to complete the work, we expect that it be done within 12 months. Um, with regard to the exact dollar amount, it would depend on the condition of the house and the size of the house. So we'd have to work on that on a case-by-case -case basis.
you can pay them mac and cheese on Sundays. Yeah. Um, the, some of the work needs to have licensed contractors, the HVAC work, the plumbing work, the electrical and such, but yeah, we can, one of our agents can work with you and we would probably look to his experience as well to assure that he could get the work done. And is there a fee to have an agent No, absolutely not. There's an application fee when you find the, home, the vacant of your dreams. But to come in, please feel free to come in any time. Our team is really good at working, hand-holding, and uh, getting you to the right spot. Question? Um, is that a holding period? I mean, obviously, this would be your primary residence, but is there a time limit before you could sell it? Yeah, there's a time limit for selling it. No. Well, you could, so, so you could buy it as an investment to sell to somebody else who would live there, or you could live there as a primary residence. Or if you wanted to buy it and you know, use it as a rental property, whatever. Some, some incentives you receive right, that's, may require you to live in the house for a while. That's true. It depends on the, the incentive. Right. Right. Okay. Great. Thank Five you. years. Yeah. Question here in the hand. Um, so basically, when you're buying one of these houses, you're acknowledging the fact that they're not livable, and you're going to have to be living and paying to live somewhere else. So how how are people that are artists and have limited It's a difficult spot because you have to have um, a housing inspector certify that the property is habitable. They, they'll come and make an inspection. That doesn't mean it's beautiful. It doesn't mean it's completely done. But it does mean it has electricity that's been inspected and signed off. It has to have plumbing and HVAC systems that are functional. It has to have intact and be secure from weather and everything like that. But it doesn't need to be completely finished before you can live in it. It just needs to be safe. And, um, and up to buying and rehabbing a vacant house isn't for everyone, mm -hmm. um, but we have some fantastic developers, both for-profit and non-profit, who have rehabilitated vacant houses, and they qualify for the incentives um, and are part of their strategy for turning around vacant housing. So you don't have to do it all yourself. Uh, here next, and then here. Um, so as I was saying, we have um, on our website, baltimorehousing.org, houses that have already been redeveloped. St. Ambrose Housing Aid Center is one of our developers. They're here uh, today. We have some great for-profit uh, developers who've done outstanding work in Oliver. And some of these properties also um, are interesting spaces for artists. In this district that we're in now, in Johnson Square and leading towards Oliver, there's some bigger properties that open up opportunities uh, for, for artists. And so these qualify for the vacant to value home ownership uh, incentives, as well as when you buy it and uh, redevelop it yourself, there are opportunities for mortgage financing and some tax benefits. And those, those finished properties are advertised on our website as well. With a, and, and the majority of those homes had been city-owned vacants. The developers bought them from us. They complete the rehab and then you go through Ken's shop to get get the incentives. Got a question here? Question. You mentioned a block by block program. How do you get when you're choosing the block uh, of homes to you know, where they It's the, the houses are a combination. The question is, how do we ch choose where to do the development block clusters? Typically, we'll we'll follow the lead of the development partners who know best what's you know their their investment strategy is, what risk they're willing to take, and they'll identify the blocks for us. Where there are city-owned vacant buildings on that block, we'll sell it to the developer, and where they're privately owned, we will use a code enforcement tool called receivership. We'll take the private um, property owner to court and ask the court to appoint a receiver who will hold a public auction of that property. So every every one of the vacants, we, we have a different tool to get that whole lock rehabbed. And then the mayor has committed other capital funding. We'll do streetscaping where necessary. We work on the sidewalks if it needs to be repaved because as we've had, you know, 50 or 60 years of, of disinvestment in the private market, there's 
you know, budgets have been tight. There's public disinvestment in some of these neighborhoods and some of these blocks as well. We want to, so while we can't provide great subsidies, like in the flush years, um, we can plant some trees and we can do, you know, make the street lighting better and things that will help minimize the risk of that investment and make that block really solid and a whole block solution. Are we going to for one more question right here in the middle? Um, we haven't necessarily done that. Um, it might be something we could look to do, like a punch list of things you might expect to have to do as you rehab a property. That's a good idea. But no, we don't have that just yet. And that's a role for your um, home contractor. contractor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we would It's kind of like we could do that, but what to expect when you're expecting? <laughs> what to expect when you're rehabbing? <laughs> Thank you all. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great folks from the city are going to be here uh, afterwards for lunch. So I've been telling you this long story about my own home buying um, experiences. And so some of you came in all late, but so years ago I bought a house um, with my wife who was a working artist and we settled in September. And we've been going for this, to the same accountant and get our taxes done for 15 years. And so we show up at our accountant's office in March during tax season. And, uh, you know, he starts asking us questions. We're chit-chatting. So we bought a house. And then sort of the Pandora's box of questions from the accountant when he heard that my wife was a working artist and was working out of the house came up. And, and to, to cut the story short, we left the accountant's office pretty immediately with a long list of things that we needed to answer and come back. Because what we didn't realize were the tax benefits on an annual basis for working in your residence uh, are significant. And we're really benefited today to have uh, uh, Bob Snyder, a uh, practicing tax attorney, to come tell us about the tax benefits of living and working in your residence. Please welcome Bob Snyder, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Um, and I thank you all for coming today and, and giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I do not have a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm the only one that doesn't. Uh, there is some material that was on the website which you had the opportunity to download and I'm going to start things off a little differently because I'm going to start off with questions and answers but I'm going to ask you the question how many people here prepare their own taxes and then how many people here get somebody else to prepare their taxes so since there's some hands that didn't go up I assume we have some non-filers as well <laughs> okay that's that's good. Uh, hopefully we have nobody here that has a uh, friend, spouse, roommate that works for the IRS because you're all going to get together over lunch and uh, could be an interesting, interesting <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> all right, this is the fun part. Um, what tax benefits do we get from buying a house? Um, there are really three. You get to deduct home mortgage interest. You get to deduct property taxes you get to deduct mortgage insurance premiums. Um, there's also one more that I didn't put in the material, but I didn't think about it until I listened to Chi, and that is um, you get to deduct ground rent, because even though it's called ground rent for tax purposes, ground rent is interest, and that is deductible as well. Now, in order to take those deductions, you have to itemize as opposed to take the standard deduction. You have your choice when you file a tax return of either itemizing, which is listing taxes, medical expenses, interest, charitable contributions, etc., or you can take what the IRS gives you as the standard deduction which for last year was $7,400 if you were single and a little over $13,000 if you were married. Uh, obviously, if you are a homeowner and are paying taxes and insurance, uh, odds are you're going to be above those $7,000 or $7,400 and $13,000 limits. So it's advantageous to itemize, and um, it's those four things that you get with home ownership. 
taxes, insurance, I'm sorry, taxes, interest, ground rent, and mortgage insurance premiums if you pay them. Now, if you also use your principal residence uh, for business purposes, you get some additional deductions. And those are things like homeowner's insurance, uh, repairs and maintenance, utilities, and something called depreciation. Depreciation is um, the ability to write off, if you will, or deduct the purchase price you paid for the home uh, over time. And um, for our purposes, that write-off is over 39 years, so it's about 2.5% a year of the purchase price of the structure. Land is not depreciable, so you have to allocate between the building and the, and the land, and you depreciate the building. Now, the amount of these deductions that you get is the portion of the house that is used for business purposes. So, for example, if you have a 1,500 square foot house and you use 300 square feet as a studio or for some other business purpose, you would get 20% of insurance, repairs, utilities, um, and 20% of what the depreciation would otherwise be as a deduction each year. You would also treat the other deductions I mentioned before, like interest and taxes, you would treat 80% of those as an itemized deduction and 20% as a business deduction. Um, and you have to do that each year. So, a couple of statistics. Um, in 2010, which is the last year that the Internal Revenue Service gave us any statistics, they're a little bit behind. Um, they tell us that about 3.4 million taxpayers claimed a business use deduction for their principal residence. But the government also tells us that somewhere of more than half of 27.8 million small businesses are home-based. So if there is approximately 14 million home-based businesses and only 3.4 million taxpayers claim this deduction, the question becomes why? They were leaving money on the table. Um, there's two primary reasons. One is this deduction has been perceived and actually has been in past years a tremendous audit risk. Um, the Internal Revenue Service targeted, as they target each year, uh, different industries and different deductions for audit. For several years, one of the items targeted for audit were people who took um, a, a deduction for the business use of their home. Um, those taxpayers often found themselves having a little bit more intimate relationship with the Internal Revenue <laughs> Service than e-filing or sending in a paper return because they got to meet face-to-face -face with an agent and explain the deductions that they took. The second thing that made the deduction um, not fully used was the complexity. You can take a look on the IRS website and look at uh, where they have all their different forms and instructions. Take a look at Form 8829. That is the business use of home de deduction form that you need to file if you're going to take the deduction. And it is very complicated. It's over 40 lines long. Um, and it, you are required to keep a lot of records. I mean, you need to keep your utility bills, you need to keep your repair bills, your insurance bills, all those things. Um, so the deduction becomes a record-keeping nightmare, if you will, uh, or at least a record-keeping burden. So anyhow, uh, assuming you, you want to take this deduction, what are the requirements for doing it? The space that you're using for business must be regularly and exclusively used for business. Well, what, what does that mean? 
It means it's a dedicated space that's used for business, whatever the business is, whether it's an art studio, whether it's recording, whatever it might be, whether it's an office space where you're keeping records of your business. Um, but it can't be a desk in the corner of the dining room, can't be the spare bedroom that's used for guests, but also used for business. It has to be exclusive business use. The second thing is, it must be your principal place of business, which means you can't have an office someplace else. I can't deduct any poor, even though I have an office in my home, I can't deduct any of the expenses associated with that office because I also have an office downtown. Um, and that's my principal place of business. It's not my home. Now, you can be an employee but have a business on the side and if the only space you have for that business is in your home, then that's the principal place of business for that business, and you're entitled to, to the deduction. Uh, a couple of, of other exceptions. It, it can be a place where you meet with customers and clients, and that'll qualify, or it can be a separate structure. Uh, and if it's a separate structure that's a principal place of business, that separate structure applies, like a renovated garage, for instance. Um, so that's the basic rules, but because the IRS is you know, always here to help us, um, <laughs> they, in 2013, only in January, uh, came to the realization that the business use deduction of a home is so complicated, we're going to make life easier for people. And the way they make life easier for people is they say, we're going to give you what, the, what we call a simplified option. Rather than keeping all these records for utility bills, repair bills, maintenance bills, insurance, whatever, we are going to let you deduct $5 per square foot, up to 300 square feet. So if you use your home for business, you can have up to a $1,500 deduction. Wow, right? Um, and you don't have to keep all these records. Now, it still has to be regularly and exclusively used for business. It still has to be your principal place of business. And if you take this $5 per square foot deduction, you're still entitled, if you itemize deductions, to take ground rent, mortgage interest, property taxes, and mortgage insurance premiums. So if you look at this deduction, what you're really doing is you're taking $5 per square foot, if you want, as opposed to doing all the record keeping, instead of taking the deductions for your pro rata portion of utilities, insurance, repairs, etc. Um, it's a lot easier, and the IRS gives you the choice of flip flopping back and forth for whatever is the most beneficial for you in any year. So you can use actual expenses one year, you can use $5 per square foot the next year. Um, their estimate is it saves, it'll save taxpayers over 1.6 million hours a year um, in record keeping and form filling out time. So I don't know what your pro rata portion of 1.6 million hours a year is, <laughs> but whatever it is, it's got to be more fun than dealing with filling out IRS forms and keeping utility bills. Pretty much it for me. Um, now I'll let you ask questions since I've already asked them of you. Question over here. In comparing the simplified deduction from previous more complicated, more labor intensive deductions that you need to be records for, um, have you found that homeowners who work out of their home save a significant amount more? Are they using money deductions for that um, convenience? Well, the, the interesting thing is, is that there's there are no statistics on this because this deduction and the ability to take this deduction of $5 a square foot was only put into law 
in January of 2013. So the first year that people are going to be able to do this is for the 2013 tax return, which is due, you know, April of 2014. So who knows? Um, you know, it'll be it'll be 2017 before they have statistics on that. Question back there. Very good question. Um, <clears throat> if you use the actual expense method, uh, you cannot, as a result of taking those expenses, generate a loss. So you can wipe out all the income, um, but you can't generate a loss that you can offset against other income, like salary. To the extent you do have a loss, you can carry that loss forward and use it in future years. If you use the simplified method of $5 a square foot, you again cannot generate a loss, but you can't carry it forward either. I don't know if I answered your question, but... Yes. Okay, thanks. Question back here. The simplified method would would work for renters as well. If you if you use a portion of the rented property for business use. Question here first, and then back up. The question. So this is clear. You said that um, the simplified version you can only um, do that five dollars per square foot up to three hundred. Up. Five dollars per square foot, up to three hundred square feet. So, so that would be correct. It would not be a benefit to you. And that, I mean, that that's per year, not per month. You know, I mean, they're they're not giving you they're not giving you a lot here. We have here. a couple in the back. Do you have questions, uh, gentlemen? This is Toto. Well, the it's a good question, but it's it's a little bit more complicated. It's a, it's a complicated answer to what's a seemingly simple question. First of all, you got to distinguish between repairs and capital improvements. Um, repairs are basically fixing things. Capital improvements are more extensive. Uh, what's a capital improvement? It's something that adapts space to a new use, length or lengthens the useful life of the building, or um, is an addition or improvement. So if it's a capital improvement rather than a repair, you have to add that to the price and depreciate it over the 40, over the 39 year period. If it's simply a repair and it's dedicated to the and the repair is dedicated to the space that you're using for business purposes the full repair would be deductible you wouldn't have to like take the percentage of the repair questions i saw some other hands up back over there yeah okay. good question um and i'm and i should have put this in the outline Points are um, points are prepaid interest, and they're called points because they're a percentage of of your mortgage loan. So if you go out and borrow a hundred thousand dollars, pick a number, and you pay two points, the two points are two percent. One point is one percent. So one percent of a of a hundred thousand dollars is a thousand dollars. That's a charge that shows up on your settlement sheet. Uh, when you purchase the house, but it's prepaid interest, and that is fully deductible in the year that you purchase the home. Uh, why do people pay points? It's a way of buying down the interest rate. So if I have a 30-year home mortgage, uh, maybe I can pay a point and get it at 3.25%. If I pay no points, I, I have 3.5% you know, or 3 and 3 eighths or something like that. Good question. Thank you. Points are deductible too. Oops. What other questions? Do you see any hands on this or something? Oh, yes, right here. I'm sorry. Um, 
When you said deducting interest, um, I know that if you're working out of the house, there's also requirements for uh, a, an insurance. There's requirements for insurance if you're actually engaging in business with people and seeing them face to face because they're coming in your home and that's separate than home insurance. Correct. Would that fall under deductible only as business or would that fall through home as well as business? Well, I, I mean, the, por the, the okay, but the portion of the ins we're talking about two different types of insurance. We're talking about homeowners insurance or lib or um, not liability, but um, you know, property property insurance that covers the house. It's a portion of that that you're going to deduct if you're paying specific insurance that relates to to your business whether it is some type of liability insurance or errors and omissions or whatever it is, that type of insurance you're going to pay whether you're, whether you're working out of your home or not. So that's fully deductible. Okay. Behind the camera, there's a question, I think? Yes. Um, there was a time if you were working out of Right. Yeah, that's um, that. Ha that's a different subject. Um, that is not a subject that relates to home ownership. That's a provision that's commonly known as um, the hobby loss provisions under the Internal Revenue Code. And there's a presumption if you haven't made money from a particular activity that you're engaged in for, uh, I believe it's two out of seven years right now. Didn't brush up on this one before I got here, but I can give you the code section since I'm, we're known to speak in code sections rather than English. <laughs> um, you're presumed to be doing it not for business purposes, but as a hobby. And if you're not engaged in an activity for business purposes, you can't take the losses. So it's a roundabout way of getting to the answer to your question. But the answer to the question really has nothing to do with home ownership. But it's free tax advice, so what the hell. Any, any other questions back there? If not, Bob, you're going to hang around? I'm going to hang around. Thank you. So a couple of weeks ago, Bob and I met ahead of this meeting. And I said, Bob, I, th I, th I want you to be prepared. There's going to be a lot of questions. And he goes, you're kidding me. I said, no, the creative people, they've got a lot of questions. Whenever we have attorneys at these events, you get a lot of questions. So I hope I proved myself right there, Bob. You did a terrific job. Uh, there are uh, uh, great benefits to working out of your house. A lot of things we've heard a lot today, but certainly tax benefits are one of the big ones. So um, you are now technically sitting in an arts and entertainment district. And these are things that are across the state of Maryland. There are three of them here in the city of Baltimore. And we learned a lot of benefits about working from your home. And if you are able to live in a home that's in an arts district, there may be even additional benefits uh, to your home ownership experience. And today we're very, very pleased to have uh, Pamela Dunn. She's a program director for community arts development for the Maryland State Art Council. And she basically manages from across the state the state arts and entertainment districts. And Pamela's going to tell you all about the things that you might benefit from if you live and work in an arts district here in the city. Thank you, Will. Um, first of all, I have to say I'm really, really happy that my father is an accountant and I don't have to do my taxes. So uh, that makes it really easy for me. Uh, I'm just going to say next for the slide. So if you next. Let me just tell you a little bit about the Arts and Entertainment District's program. First of all, it's administered by the Maryland State Arts Council, and you all um, may be familiar with the Maryland State Arts Council. How many of you are artists? Good, a good portion. Excellent. Well, you'll be very interested in this then. Um, the Arts and Entertainment District program has been around for over 10 years. We're going into the second decade. It was legislated in 2001. And Maryland is actually the second, and if there's no one here from Rhode Island, as we say, we were the first to have an arts and entertainment districts program. Uh, there are 20 districts across the state, 
And as Will mentioned, there are actually three here in Baltimore. A district is designated for a 10-year period, beginning on July 1st of the designated year. Next. Um, as I said, they span the state geographically. Uh, there are districts on the eastern shore. If you ever go down the ocean, you go through one in uh, Cambridge, in Salisbury, in Worcester County, where Ocean City lives. There's one in Berlin, one in Snow Hill, and then in western Maryland, Frostburg, Cumberland. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to Frederick, very alive arts and entertainment district. Um, so they're across the state, and they're in all sorts of jurisdictions. Um, rural, as I mentioned, and suburban. Wheaton is a arts and entertainment district, Silver Spring, Bethesda, and also metropolitan environments. Baltimore is uh, one of the biggest. And the majority are under 100 acres. They're very small. But the largest is over 350 acres. And in fact, Highland Town is, I believe, pushing 400 acres. So it's a very large district. Next. Uh, this is a map which kind of gives you an overview. Uh, this is on our website and tells you where the districts are located. Um, there are often a lot of uh, other um, types of incentive programs that are in, within the districts. For example, Main Street programs are there, heritage area, um, heritage preservation, tourism areas. So there are addition, additional overlaps uh, in each of the districts. Next. Um, so the three Baltimore A&E districts, which is what we're going to look at today um, in terms of, of when they were designated, Station North was designated in 2002 and was redesignated for another 10 years in 2012. Highland Town was designated in 2003 and is up for redesignation this year, and so we're keeping our fingers crossed. I'm pretty sure you can count on Highland Town being uh, redesignated as an arts and entertainment district. But don't tell Chris Ryer that if he's here. here. Oh, jeez, OK. Um, and then we have Broma Tower, the newest arts and entertainment district, was designated in 2012. Next. So what is the purpose of this program? Uh, those of you that are artists already know the purpose of the program. It really is to develop vibrant, creative, clusters throughout communities in Maryland. And each one of them is very, very unique. Um, you can imagine there's a huge difference between Snow Hill um, and or Frostburg and Station North. It's, it's an incredible. Each one is very, very unique, depending upon the community. And they also, one of the big things about the arts and entertainment districts is they do offer op opportunities for really dynamic and participatory arts experiences. You're going to see some slides um, that are festivals. For example, the Maryland Folk, uh, Folk Life Festival in Highland Town. Um, lots of festivals, open air events, that sort of thing. Next. So the purpose of it really is to encourage community involvement and revitalization. And areas where artists like yourself can live work and create and prosper. Next. So what are the incentives? The state of Maryland and the local jurisdictions have certain incentives that they have put forth to encourage the program um, to be successful in Maryland. The first one we're going to look at is the real property tax credit. Next. So for real property tax, um, in an arts and entertainment district, a property that is eligible for the property tax is dedicated to the visual or performing arts. This can be new construction or it can be uh, renovation. And it can be um, a, an opportunity for artists to have live workspace. So it can be a particular artist's development where artists can live. So the developer, developer can take the property tax credit for those type of A&E enterprises. Next. In Baltimore City, the property tax credit. Um, each district has a 10-year eligibility for the property tax credit. And this has to do with the increase in the property tax. When you purchase a building, if you're going to use it uh, as an artist studio or an arts and entertainment enterprise, the property has an initial 
um, cost for the property tax or an initial uh, dedication for the property tax. Let's say it's $100,000 value. When you finish uh, renovating the property, it's now worth $300,000. So the value or the, the property tax credit is on that difference in value. In Baltimore City specifically, it differs all over the state and in terms of the district, but in Baltimore City, um, there is an 80% property tax credit for the first five years. After that, it's a descending basis and it goes to 30% on the 10th year. Next. Someone asked this about a building gas station, that sort of thing. For this property tax credit, the building must be zoned commercial, manufacturing, or industrial. Um, that's okay, next. You have to do certain things in order to be able to get this property tax credit. You have to have a building permit. Um, it has to be certified by the A&E district manager or the local government that it is for an arts and entertainment district enterprise or artist housing. And you do have to be in touch with both state and local Department of Assessment and Taxation. Next. Uh, so the next thing we'll talk about is what is the benefit to you as an individual artist living in an arts and entertainment district? A qualifying artist, and I'll get to that in a, in a moment, pays no state or local tax on qualifying income. And the form you use is that one, 502 AE. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Next. So what is a qualifying residing artist? The artist must own or rent real property within Baltimore City, if you are in a Baltimore City A&E district. You must create, write, compose, or execute an original creative work of art within the district. So you have to live in Baltimore City but you have to actually create and do your work in an A&E district, one of the three. And you have to derive income from the sale or performance of that work within the A&E district. So currently, if you live in Highland Town, or if you live in Baltimore City, you have a studio in Highland Town, and you sell your work from a gallery in Highland Town, you are eligible to take this uh, tax credit and you pay no tax on the work that you sell there. Next. This doesn't apply to um, industry-related production. Yes. Which kind of tax are you talking about? Income tax or sales tax? Income tax. This is the individual artist income tax subtraction modification. It's a mouthful, but that's what it's called. Um, so uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work for industry-related production, such as commercial or advertising copy, and services such as tailoring, uh, clothing, alteration or jewelry repair, doesn't count for those, but if you are a clothing designer or if you are a jewelry artist, it does count for you and you sell your work. Next. Uh, so then the other benefit, there are, there are actually three, and this probably doesn't pertain, won't pertain to most of you but it's an abatement of the admissions and amusements tax. And this is a tax that's levied on gross receipts from admissions. For example, in the Charles Theater, they sell tickets, and were they not in an A&E district, they would have to pay the admissions and amusements tax, which increases the cost of the tickets. Um, in Baltimore City, the, the rate can vary from 5 to 15 percent. And if you're a nonprofit performing arts en entity, you would not be paying this anyway. I think across the state there are probably around 10 entities that actually have the abatement of the admissions and amusements tax. Next. Uh, so, and again, this is just to, uh, you know, to clarify what an arts and entertainment enterprise is. It's dedicated to the visual or performing arts. You can include literary arts in that. It uh, was just kind of left out of the legislation, but literary arts are included. And a qualified residing artist located in an A&E district um, is exempt from payment of the admissions and amusements tax. So if you had a performance space and you were selling tickets to that performance and you are not in it, you're not a nonprofit and you are not in an A&E district, you would have to pay that tax. So again, another benefit of living, uh, of working 
and performing or selling your work in an A&E district. Next. So, what about Baltimore? What have we got here? Well, first of all, as Will mentioned, you are sitting in an A&E district. Uh, this is Station North, and Ben Stone from Station North should be here uh, at lunchtime to tell you about Station North. You can just look around you and see some of the wonderful activities that take place here. How many of you do have activities that you attend in Station North? You're at MICA. So you're pretty familiar with this district. And if you'd like to go to the website, it's stationnorth.org, and you can visit there, or you can just walk around and see what's available here to you, including wonderful public art in the mid middle of North Avenue. Next. So we're, we're going to look at, real quickly, Highland Town, since we're not there. Next. And this is where Highland Town is located. Uh, it's the yellow area up there. It's in southeast Baltimore, and you can see that it's on the north and east side of Patterson Park, which is an incredibly beautiful place. Next. And here are some of the activities that are taking place. You can see that it is a very vibrant and exciting place to be. There are lots of complimentary um, businesses along with the arts and entertainment enterprises. There are uh, additional retail space. Restaurants always come along with the arts and entertainment enterprises. Um, wonderful festivals. Next. Uh, you can see some of the community work that goes on in Highland Town is very much like that. It's a very community-based A&E district. Lots of diverse um, communities and individuals there. Next. And here are some of the um, signature events highlighting the community artists. This is the Maryland Traditions Folk Festival, which is outside of the Creative Alliance. In fact, it's coming up uh, June 15th. June 15th? June 15th. So be sure to be there. Uh, then we have the uh, Halloween Lantern Parade, lots of other festivals and activities, as I mentioned. Next. Um, also wonderful spaces. The, the library is a performance space, Skyloft Gallery. I believe the one on the upper left is probably the Crown Cork and Seal. That's which Mark is it? Yeah, Mark okay, and um, an artist in the district. And that, of course, is the Creative Alliance at the Patterson, where tons of wonderful things happen in Highland Town. Next. Uh, some additional new places. Uh, I know some of you have visited the Baltimore Thread Quarters. I've heard that. Pine Box Art Center, Charm City Movement Arts, and then there's a pop-up gallery project which puts visual arts in empty storefronts in Highland Town. Next. And Chris Ryer is here. These, this is some of the architecture in uh, Highland Town. Well, the pagoda is not part of the Highland Town architecture, but it is in the park. Next. Um, so Chris Ryer is here, and he can tell you more about the housing. He's with the Community Development Corporation Southeast, and he can tell you what kinds of things are available there. As you can see, low-cost housing for artists, um, 69000 to be renovated, up to 140 already renovated, so pretty good. And this is uh, Chris's um, contact information, and again, he will be here. He is here. Next. Okay, so next, our newest district, Bromo Tower. Krista, are you here? Hi. Krista Green is here, uh, the manager for, for the Bromo Tower District out of uh, Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts. Next. And this is located right downtown, slightly west, and you can see an outline of the district there. And many of the um, assets within the district, organizations, um, galleries, etc. Next. And, of course, the Hippodrome is there, and I have to tell you, my grandmother was an usherette at the Hippodrome when it was vaudeville. So this holds a really interesting uh, place in my heart. And there's Everyman Theater, the Everyman Theater, which uh, was in Station North, now in Bromo Tower District, expanded a beautiful new building. Next. And then there's EMP Collective, another performing arts entity, nonprofit. Uh, within the district. Next. Galleries, independent galleries, Gallery 4, Nude Shank Gallery. Next. And artist studios. So tons of things going on. Next. 
Lexington Market is there, as I said, complimentary. Restaurants, retail, um, the, the Lexington Market, as you all probably know, is a Baltimore keepsake. There's no other word for it. Next. And some wonderful um, performance art, uh, fluid movement. This is the Howard and Lex Street performance. Next. Articulate Baltimore, mural project, uh, murals all over Bromo Tower. Next. And uh, the A&E tax incentives that uh, are available in the Bromo Tower district. Next. So there you have it. Arts and entertainment districts, Baltimore, live, work, play. Do you have any questions about the art? Yes, question back here. You can sell your work online. Uh, you have to sell it from the district. So it would have to be mailed from the district. And I will say with the um, individual artist income tax subtraction modification, such a mouthful, um, you do have to keep records. So you have to indicate you know, where, where the work was sold, when it was sold, how much it was. You have to keep really good records for that. Yeah, that, that's a, a nuance that I really wasn't aware of that Station North did. Wherever your, wherever the closest, closest post office is, I guess the zip code, Ben, does that make sense? I think it's really a business address, it doesn't matter where you actually go to FedEx, it's not about okay. where you're actually going. Yeah. Mailed from the district is where, you, where your address is. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You just have to, you have to live in Baltimore City. So you can, if you live in Baltimore City, it's wherever, it's currently wherever your studio is, where you're creating your work. Um, now, if you are a performer and you live in Baltimore City and you do a performance at EMP uh, Collective, you have created your work there because the work is the performance and you've gotten paid for it so you've sold it there so there are these nuances that um, that really your your manager should be able to speak with you about um, a performance is a little different than selling an actual piece of visual art any other questions yes As long as you perform sometimes in that district, do you, does your entire year's income qualify? It's only, the, it's only the income that you get from the district. When you perform in the district, um, so it's only in that district. Any other questions? Yes, back here.
after the work is completed. So in other words, you have to have the work completed. You have your property then reassessed before you, you know, you're going to be making your next property um, tax payment. So it's after, it's after the property has been reassessed. So that for that 10 year period, you're getting a credit that is from the $5,000 to the $150,000. You're getting a credit on that amount after it's reassessed. Right, but during a year of that 10 years, do you have to reapply? Is it a, a, an assumption that then you're going to be continuing to have to reapply? Is it something that's given once? Can a bank count on that as part of your escrow? I would say it probably varies from district to district because the the credit itself varies from district to, to district. So I would say talk to the manager within your district to see what he would recommend, he or she. Can okay, you want to talk to me after um, the, the program's over and each situation's uh, individual, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Any other questions? Yes, here. Caterers would not. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this pretty much concludes the business, except for a couple of things. One, um, I have to thank Bill and Randy from Baltimore Office of Promotion of the Arts. This is all their fault, I swear. The people give me pleasure, but they really did help us. And, and, and they, they really do provide leadership along with the, the folks you had from Baltimore Housing, it just, all of these things uh, that they do really help make our city a vibrant place. And as you can see here, what we've done is we've sort of mashed a couple of things. We've mashed the creative class with the housing industry. And um, I think it's been a terrific turnout, but it was really, again, a conversation that Bill had with the mayor, which brought us here today. A um, couple of thank yous. If you all do not have this as a website that you visit regularly, you have to go to What Weekly all the time. It's a terrific website. Uh, Brooke and Justin are here somewhere. They're probably in the back, but they were the ones that really, from a managerial standpoint, along with David London, helped pull all this together. Uh, I, I did not know them until recently, and I do check their website. They are documenting the renaissance of our city in fabulous ways. I want to thank my coworkers from PNC Bank. Uh, all of the great folks here from Baltimore City did a terrific job. Um, the three arts districts, of course, the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance, Jeannie Howe, who's in the middle of so many things in our city. I want to thank Jeannie for helping us get the word out. Uh, Steve and the team at Live Baltimore. Um, um, Mr. Snyder came to us by way of something called the Maryland Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. If you have not gone to their website or gone to any of their events for creative people, they're an absolutely fabulous resource, and we've been partnering with them on a number of things. Um, Social Enterprise Alliance uh, will help promote this today. AIA Baltimore, architects see themselves as creative people, and they were quite enthusiastic to be involved. We talked a lot about the importance of homeownership counseling. We had three agencies that were supporting us today. It was Jubilee Baltimore, um, Neighborhood Housing Services of Baltimore, and St. Ambrose Housing Aid Center, all organizations that provide for, for traditional, sort of easy access information to homeownership that's not anything other than just providing you a free service. They have really good resources there, and I encourage everybody, if you're thinking about buying a home, to make that one of your first steps. Um, the folks from MyCare Career Development are here, the Megans, they are really uh, doing wonderful things with their graduates so that the minute MyCare students graduate, um, they were trying to figure out how is it that they can live and thrive and be productive people here in the region and everywhere, and they were just a, a terrific partner with us on this endeavor. Um, Maryland Art Place, if you haven't been down there, there's their spot down there at, um, at uh, Power Plant Live. I always call it PowerPoint Live. I don't know why, but Power Plant Live. <laughs> it's a really fun art place. Uh, the Maryland State Art Council uh, is another uh, big supporter of this event, and they've been just great, John Shrett Reiser and his team. And lastly, I do really do want to thank again Buzzy uh, Kuzak, who gave us this space for free the day after the Maryland Film Festival. I hear the party wrap at about 1 o'clock last night, so I was kind of surprised to see him here today. Uh, but anyway, and then lastly, um, I want to thank Joe Squared Pizza, and you haven't had a chance to thank him, but you can thank him when you leave out of here today, uh, because apparently I think there's a whole pile of pizzas back there for everybody to enjoy. So please stay around. 
Please enjoy yourself, and most importantly, ask a lot of questions. We've got all the resources here. And thank you all for coming. Have a great afternoon.